speaker. Our next speaker is our executive director. Um, he uh, teaches at Carleton University. He's got a PhD. He's been writing and thinking about cannabis for, well, since the 80s. Um, I, I've worked with Craig for a while. This is a, a deep thinker and a powerful speaker. Um, normal Canada is absolutely blessed to have an advocate such like Craig, with Craig's skill set as our executive director. He is the person who talks to, when the media contact us, he's, he's the one who runs the day-to-day -day operations. He is just a, a towering force. So we're blessed to have Craig Jones, our executive director. Please welcome Craig Jones. <laughs> Well, that's a very, very kind introduction. I'm, I'm going to uh, immediately lower your expectations because I, I can't quite meet that. Uh, but I actually, I want to I wanna open by saying a very sincere thank you to Paul and the whole Toronto crowd that are scattered around here, Jack Lloyd and Abby and Jenna and all the people that actually, actually do the day-to-day -day stuff because I can't do it from the other side of the province where I live in Kingston. Uh, I depend on these people to feed information to me, to give me ideas, to keep me honest, to keep me on the path. I mean, we've all been in this struggle, some of us, for a very long time. I'm looking at John Conroy and Alan Young have been in this longer than I have. But I guess, you know, when the next government is formed, it'll be up to me and probably one or two other people to go to Ottawa and actually make the case. And that's a big part of what I'm here for today because I'd like, I have my own ideas, of course. I've been working on this for a long time, and there are a couple of urgent points that I want you to make, and then I want you to tell me what you think about them. Uh, I, I, I wasn't here for the entirety of the last panel, but I did hear some conversation about uh, how to vote in this coming election. And I know there's only a handful of people here, you know, it's hard to make a difference with a handful of people in one room, but our electoral system is an archaic institution designed in the 17th century for men who held property and no one else. And it's very important that you understand how out of sync our electoral system is with our current reality as a multicultural society. But what they did with this electoral system was simply add other people into it. First they added men who were not property holders, and then they added women, because eventually women became property holders, they had to add them. But it was very kind of, you know, ad hoc, <laughs> bubblegum chewing wire kind of operation. And that is, it's, it's very much like our drug laws. They've just been uh, uh, modified as need arose, and not with any design or plan in mind. So as a, as a consequence, we are operating with a an electoral system today, it's called single member plurality or first past the post. That is entirely out of sync with our needs as a contemporary Canadian multicultural society. So that's the first thing you have to understand is how out of sync our electoral system is. That said, one political party is advocating and serious about changing our electoral system and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm it's the Liberals. So that would be a major advancement if we could hold their feet to the fire and get them to modernize our electoral system. Because under the current system, this election coming, October 19, it's entirely possible for the Prime Minister to form another majority government with a minority of all the votes cast, like he did last time. That's the way our electoral system works. And by the way, that is also the way the Liberals managed to stay in power for as long as they did because people in the, on the right split their vote across the alliance and the Reform and the Conservative Party, right? So I urge you to think about this when you're deliberating over your vote. I'd, I'm anticipating that there's not many Conservative voters here. One party... One party is making a strong case for electoral reform, for reform of our voting system, and that's the Liberal Party. So not only are they 
promising to legalize cannabis, but they're promising to modernize our electoral system. And I think those are two very important things for you to think about. Right. Now, the second thing is, what is the second thing? Oh, no, here it is, here it is, here it is. Um, our, our political parties are uh, not, not, they don't function very well. And one of the reasons they don't function very well is because the, the leadership structure basically takes over running the party between elections. Our, our political parties have sort of devolved to being machines strictly for running elections, and that's it. They kind of vanish into the woodwork. They just go dormant between elections, and that's an unfortunate thing about the Westminster system, but that's the system we have. But it doesn't have to be that way, because ordinary people, like the people in this room, can run those parties from the grassroots if we take interest in them. So what I'm calling upon you to do between now and October 19th, if you can find a couple of hours a week to volunteer for, a, for the candidate of your choice, hopefully a candidate that is in favor of reform of our drug laws, that, that message gets through to the leadership. Just imagine if every liberal party candidate across the country had two or three people working in their office, talking to that candidate, going door to door, delivering flyers, answering phones and sending out phone messages on a daily basis, advocating for drug policy reform. Just imagine if that was in their face all the time. That message, that message gets through to the leadership. So I'm encouraging you, I'm calling on you, if you can find a couple of hours a week to volunteer for the liberal candidate in your riding, talk about drug policy reform, yes, of course, but also talk about electoral reform. That's the kind of democratic reform that can re-energize the political parties and take them back to the people who actually matter, people on the street, us, in other words. Okay, those are the two key messages that I wanted to deliver. Now, the third thing, and this is, this is a little, we gotta look down the road here because cannabis, cannabis policy reform is coming. It's like the tide, it's coming. And the reason it's coming is because events are happening in the United States. There's a very good prospect that in 2016, California will legalize. At which time, the war on drugs, as far as cannabis is concerned, is basically concluded, at least in the United States. Okay? I think I can say that with some confidence. Various jurisdictions will hold out for various lengths of time, but California is regarded as a bellwether state. Once California legalizes, the whole of the United States will legalize, and the pressure on Canadians to do something, say we have another Harper majority, God forbid, <laughs> will be intense, okay? So we've got to think about this. Because cannabis is only one part of the equation, albeit a very big part of the equation, there are a number of other psychotropic drugs out there, everything from methamphetamine to cocaine to heroin, that have to be, we have to modernize our policies towards them as well. This, this seems like, yeah, I mean, this is only, <coughs> I'm glad you're thinking about this because like, uh, for, for people in the drug policy movement, people like me who have been in the drug policy movement for a long time, it's a bit like, you know, uh, Vladimir Lenin talking about the revolutionaries in Russia, and there were certain revolutionaries who just wanted to get off the train in Poland, right? In other words, if I get, if I can turn Poland into a socialist republic, that's fine, I'm, I don't care about the rest of the world. But it can't happen like that. That would be a very bad thing for drug policy reform. Not because drug policy reform would, re would be rolled back and we would eventually lose cannabis, I don't think that's in the cards, but because we're the cutting edge, we're the camel's nose under the tent, a much larger problem, which is the whole domain of psychotropic drugs and our addiction to oppression generally, addiction to oppression. Have you heard this term? Those of you who saw that very powerful video by Louise Arbour, I think that's the most powerful message from that video. We, as a species, are addicted to oppression. It manifests itself in cannabis, but that is changing. But cannabis is only one part of the equation. And those of us who have seen, who have understood the arguments, who have made the case, who have gone this far, 
with cannabis policy reform, we now have to turn our attention to all those other drugs. Now, I'm not standing here making a case for legalization and regulation of methamphetamine. I mean, I can make that case, but that's not why I'm here today. I'm asking you to pick up your gaze from cannabis after this victory is won and look over the horizon to see how we can relieve the burden of suffering and the business of oppression on all those other drug users. Yeah. So those are, my, those are my three key messages. We have to keep our eyes on the prize, which is modernization of drug laws across the spectrum. We have to send a signal to the Liberals and all the other parties as well that we got to be taken seriously. This is a point that Paul makes repeatedly. We have to make, they, we have to make them know that we are a constituency that wields some clout. We got to show up to vote and more important, we got to press the political parties for democratic reform so that our votes really matter. That's, that's really all I have to say other than saying again, thank you to Paul and Abby and uh, Jenna and all the Toronto people that make this happen. Thank you to John for coming out. Thank you to Alan for tolerating the smoke. And I'm happy to, to answer any questions uh, or you know, entertain any uh, abuse. Thank you, Craig. Thank you very much. So um, the uh, next speaker. We are at a historic time and uh, hopefully we can get all our friends and neighbors out there and let's get rid of these guys. It's not just in cannabis area that they've done a lot of damage to Canada. You know, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982 was brought in by Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Jean Chrétien and it has saved us from a horrible situation. If it wasn't for the Charter, if we hadn't become a constitutional democracy in 1982, we would be in serious trouble. Thank God for the independent courts who have stood up to this stuff and struck it down as being unconstitutional. Very few places in the world that you can do that. You can do it in Canada. Thank you.